Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. Each week on this program, we talk about different aspects of the journey of following Jesus Christ. Because he does offer us, uh, of course, many promises and blessings, but he also, as he calls us to follow him, gives us great challenges. Sometimes those challenges are, in fact, to draw us closer to him, sometimes in a difficult way, calling us to make difficult decisions that seem like hurdles that we have to step over, sometimes making choices that hurt, not only ourselves but others. And I look forward to having my guest on this evening, Lynn Nordhagen, been a member of the Coming Home Network for about five years or so, and many in the Coming Home Network have heard her story. Her story was first printed in a, in a short form in uh, the Journey Home book. Uh, but the reason she's here tonight, we've waited to have her for this program tonight, is because her book finally came out recently, entitled When Only One Converts. And her story, and this book deals with many stories of those for whom their conversion to the Catholic Church in following Christ has caused great upheaval in their lives sometimes in their marriages, and particularly, and this is our theme for tonight, has caused loneliness. We're going to talk tonight about the loneliness of the journey home. We see it modeled in Christ. Tonight we'll hear about how Lynn and others have experienced the struggle of loneliness in its relationship to their following of Christ. Now you're an important part of this program, so we'd like you to call your, in your questions at 1-800-221-9460. Or you can send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Lynn, welcome to the program. Nice to be here. We've talked about it for quite a while, mm -hmm. and uh, we've delayed it, though, not only because uh, your book was coming out, but because another book came out recently, right? Yes, Surprised by Truth too. That's right. Yes, the long version of my story is in. That's right, which gives, us, which gives us the freedom to not have to cover every aspect of a person's journey tonight. So if you want to hear more of Lynn's journey into the faith. It is published <clears throat> in Surprised by Truth, too. But I'll tell you what, let's begin like we usually do and have you share a little bit of your early spiritual journey. Okay. I was raised Catholic. That's uh, a great blessing in my life. My parents were both converts, and they one of their first prayers was to find a home near a Catholic school. Mm -hmm. That prayer was answered. I lived right across the street from the grade school I attended. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, I could walk to grade school, uh, the Catholic high school, and the Catholic college, Gonzaga, um, all Which my many life. Which right now may have been hearing about because <laughs> Gonzaga made it to the, the Sweet 16 basketball. Yes. So all my life, I lived uh -huh. in this wonderful Catholic neighborhood surrounded by good Catholic schools. And um, we, uh, we lived in uh, St. Aloysius Parish, a Jesuit parish, next to the university. And um, so... And it was the um, late 50s and early 60s, so it was kind of a before Vatican II most of the time, and, and right during Vatican II and after. Mm -hmm. And it was a classic Catholic school upbringing. You went through all the hoops that, <laughs> that many in the audience are familiar with through their Catholic mm -hmm. school with days. All the catechism, all the Stations of the Cross every Lent, and yeah. all the um, all the rituals, all the being in choir for funerals and right. everything. And the v first grade is when I really um, learned that Jesus died for my sins. Mm. And sister said, if you were the only one on earth, he would have loved you enough to die for you. And I said, I believe that. That's uh -huh. for me. So I date my acceptance of his right. gift from very young. And that's a blessing yeah. to have known Christ very early in life. Yes to always be with you during that. And that isn't always the case for some of us. Some of us did and then kind of forgot and came back. Now, uh, your, your journey takes a, a different turn. Yeah. Uh, did, did you, had you met your husband in college or was it after college? Um, it was during college. The, uh, his pastor was a Pentecostal preacher in an independent charismatic church. Mm -hmm. And they came and did prayer meetings at the uh, Catholic college campus. And um, so we met through the charismatic prayer meetings there, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how we met and got married and started a family, and he knew that I was planning to stay Catholic my entire life, and uh, but he didn't really think I would 
stick mm. with it because he knew I was very enthusiastic about the charismatic movement and he thought once I um, got more excited about it I would just join him. Mm. Um, so for three years I did stay Catholic and I even taught CCD and did some other active things in the parish. Um, but it, there came a time when I just got bored and disillusioned and thought, you know, the charismatic church, they're all enthusiastic about Jesus. They call him by his first name, and we've always just said our Lord, and they, they just have so much enthusiasm, and we're just so quiet and boring. And, huh. and they talk about communion. They, they have spiritual communion, so maybe I won't miss that. So I, I did join my husband in his church, hmm. and uh, we raised our four kids in that church for 10 years. 10 years, all right. And it was a very happy time. I, I was really involved. I remember when you described it earlier, uh, you said it was their love for Jesus. Yes, yeah. That had won your heart. Right. They were just their intimacy, it seemed, that they had more intimacy with Jesus, that they talked about him constantly, that he was the center of their life, and that's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. I just wanted more of Jesus. I thought I could get it that way. The theme that, uh, that we've chosen for tonight has to do with the loneliness of the journey. Was mm -hmm. loneliness a... a a part of that first change from Catholicism into the charismatic movement? At the time I would have denied it, but looking back I say, you know, there was a lot of tension there trying to stay Catholic and seeing all the enthusiasm and the community spirit in the Protestant church and I wanted to be part of that fellowship and I didn't want to be seen as an outsider and, mm -hmm. and it was fun, better to um, be involved, but it was also important to go to church together, and my husband did not ever want to come to Catholic Mass, so okay. I went to be with him. And so again, in this aspect of it, you have, <clears throat> on the one hand, you might have those things you were taught as a child, mm -hmm. the issues of doctrine, dogma, mm -hmm. practice, and rites, mm -hmm. but you also then have relationships, right. and you're thinking of leaving the Catholic Church to go to the Protestant Church, You've got all your family's mm -hmm. feelings, mm -hmm. brothers and sisters. Yeah, all the oldest all, of seven. So okay, yeah. all their perspectives and all that. But on top of that, you have your your husband's desires and impressions, and then you have all the drawing of that. Mm -hmm. And and what happens is you had to weigh right. all of this versus what you had been taught to right. be true. And I would say that I at the decision time it was where can I best love Jesus and that's yeah. where I went right. and and I had to it was hard to explain to my parents and mm -hmm. hard to explain to mm -hmm. my best friend priests and yeah yeah that's kind of an underlying question we're looking at tonight is this what you just said where and how is the most uh, the best way that I can love Christ right. and how can I be most pleasing to him mm -hmm. And when we're in an area, in a situation, especially if loneliness is deep in our heart, all those other voices can be trying to tell us one thing or another. Mm -hmm. How do you know? All right. Mm -hmm. Well, there you are as a charismatic, uh, and I imagine as a family, you were united for 10 years and happy as bugs in a rug. Yes, we were. Um, well, what opened your heart to the Catholic Church again? I started at just out of the blue, it seemed to me, having some dreams. Um, when I grew up, out our back kitchen window, you could see the orange spires of St. Aloysius, Ch I mean, the spires of St. Aloysius Church with an orange sunset behind them every night. And it was just uh -huh. impressed on my memory that, that I always wanted to be able to see that. I always wanted to feel that that was uh, a symbol of the church to me. And, hmm. and then I also started dreaming about my professors in college and how they had taught me and loved me and mm. and would never um, understand where I was now. Mm. So I called one of them up and I said, uh, Father, I just want to come say hi. And so I called him and I went, I went over and I visited with him and I said, now I'm not here to come back to the church or anything. I want you to know I'm very happy. And I told him that um, I didn't miss communion because we have spiritual communion and I didn't miss this, that, or the other thing. I was just saying hi to him because he happened to be in a dream and he went <laughs> along with that <laughs> for a while. And uh, so I said goodbye and then I called him back in a couple of weeks. And then I called him back in a couple of weeks more. <laughs> and 
I kept talking things through with him until a real longing for the Eucharist developed. Mm. And uh, I really needed to go back. Mm. Did those discussions involve like some of the dogma and doctrines that you were being taught in the new church versus what you yes. had growing up? Yes, uh-huh. uh, especially about, you know, whether the early church, one of the appeals of the most Protestant churches is we're going to get rid of all that ritual and um, all the things that have built up that aren't like the early church. And so this church said, no, we're just like the early church. All we do is love Jesus and meet together and sing and pray, and that's all they did, too. And um, But I got a new understanding of the early church that right. wasn't quite like that. Did you looking at the early church fathers, actually, and seeing... That came later, yes, but okay. uh, I did read uh, Cardinal Newman at the time and some other good books from the, from the uh, so University was, Library. Was it hard actually. coming back? Was it hard? Yes, it was hard coming back in a way because um, my husband was very unhappy about that. Mm. Here we'd had all this good unity for 10 years, and he was afraid I was going to upset the kids, confuse them. You know, if I could be Catholic and he could be something else, maybe they would decide they could be Buddhist or anything. Mm. They wouldn't have to think that we were unified and correct. We could, they could just choose anything like we did. And he was very worried about that. And I really couldn't blame him, but I still, I had mm. to be able to follow the truth as I saw it and be able to share it with my kids. Had you shared with them? That you were Up to back. that point, no, he said to me, don't tell them that you're going to the Catholic Church because we're going to present a united front. You don't even mention it. And it took me many months to get to the point where I would say, okay, now I really am going to have to talk to them as I am. I am a Catholic and I am going to say what I think about some things that you might not agree with, but we can still say to them, we are both Christians. Mm. We both love Jesus. Well, what was the impact then when you finally came into the church in terms of your relationships with so many? Um, well, my husband mellowed after a while. You know, that, uh, that was helpful. And we decided to, on a compromise where um, I would attend church with him uh, and the family on Sunday mornings, and I would go to Mass on Saturday nights. So um, they knew I was going to church on Saturday nights, and sometimes I would take one or two with me. And, but most of the time, we all went as a family to the, mm. to the other, to his church. So you'd make it work, and you'd compromise a little bit, and you're happy as bugs in a rug. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what happened? Because um, <laughs> it didn't just it, stay the same. It thing. didn't stay the same. Um, I got a job where um, one of the co-workers that I was working with was a five-point Calvinist. And he was extremely... Five, our audience may not know exactly. I can't, in fact, I can't remember them all either, <laughs> but that, that would be the most uh, stringent, uh -huh. strict uh, application of Calvinist theology right. to life and theology. Right. And well, you believe that Christ died for the elect and only for the elect. And that and the once saved, always saved. Once and, saved, you will persevere to the end. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and he was very convinced and... Uh, he thought he could show me from the original documents and, and Luther and Calvin and the real original writings that they had that uh, Catholic teaching was unscriptural. And so for a year over the lunchroom table, we exchanged books and arguments. And I would go to the Gonzaga Library and get out some books and bring them to him. He would take them and, and uh, put a bookmark in them and mark all the scriptures that contradicted all the things. And uh, finally, he convinced me that Luther and Calvin had some really good arguments. And that was the first time that I'd really come up against mm -hmm. the intellectual side of the Protestant Reformation. Mm -hmm. Before that, it was all, you know, love Emotional and enthusiasm. Side, sure. And now it was, maybe they really did have some really good questions. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that my Catholic education had really given me all the answers because I hadn't applied them at the same time before. Yet. The answers with the questions. <laughs> the right. answers with the questions. They right. hadn't meshed. How did your husband feel about this at the time? Uh, he was relieved. He was relieved that I was a Protestant again, even though so I... So you actually went back. I, I went back to the... Right. I, went to, I joined the uh, Calvinist Presbyterian Church in town. Okay. And that wasn't my husband's church, and he didn't want to come there either, but he was relieved that I was at least a Protestant and, and uh, that we could have this united front again with the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, 
at least we're defining ourselves, you know, not Catholic. And um, the kids were, I, I think they were a bit confused, but. Sure. I, would you say, when you look back at that time and you know you were Presbyterian, did, had you jumped in with both feet? I mean, you were truly a Presbyterian, truly Calvinist. Oh, yes. I right. took I took off with the, all the studying I could get my hands on. And the pastor there was um, a really good teacher. I knew his Hebrew and his Greek. And mm. I eventually got called to teach in their seminary. Mm. Um, and it was a very studious church. Everybody mm. there liked to study, and okay. we would study... Mm -hmm. A very word-centered Theology church, right? and right. scripture, right. very deeply. All right, well, again, the family's back together. Then what eventually brings you back to the Catholic Church? <laughs> the same How friend, long were you in the Presbyterian Church? In the Presbyterian Church, I was there for six years again. Okay. Right. Uh, some things started to tickle my interest, like the Evangelicals and Catholics Together uh, book came out with various responses and essays about it. Oh, there were, yeah, let's see. What year was that? That was about... Must have been 95? Yeah, mid, early 90s. A document came out in which a group of Catholic scholars and evangelical scholars mm -hmm. worked together to release a document, evangelicals it, and Catholics together. Right. right, so that we could present a common front on issues like abortion and mm -hmm. pro-life issues. And That's right. And right. so Culture. that document came out, but not everybody liked it. That's right. On either side, and there were books... Uh, that were, were published critiquing it. Right. Okay. So as I read about that, I thought, well, maybe there's something to the Catholic arguments here. And uh, then this co-worker um, told me that he was going to become a Catholic. He'd been reading all along for the last five or six years, and he had read more and more Catholic things. He says that he started when he was trying to convince me to leave it, and he just kept reading, and then he said he was going to become a Catholic. And I said, well... It's all nice in the books, but you're not going to find that when you go to the church. You go ahead, but I am never going back. Mm -hmm. So uh, he said, well, I don't know any Catholics in town. I thought maybe you could introduce me to someone. I said, I don't know anybody anymore. So he said, well, would you write to this email address and just ask this person if they know anybody? And he gave me Pat Madrid's email address. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, dear Mr. Madrid, because he didn't have a computer and I did, right? Dear Mr. Madrid, not for me, but for a friend. Do you have any acquaintances in Spokane that are good Catholics? And Pat didn't know anybody in Spokane. He wrote back very promptly and said, I'm sorry, I don't know anybody in Spokane, but could I send you a copy of my book? No strings attached. <laughs> and I said, I'd already been resisting reading the book because a couple of people had told me about it, and I didn't want to read it. But since he offered, I said, okay, if you send it to me, I'll read it. It came on the mail on the day I was sick at home, and I read it straight through. That was Surprised by Truth 1. That was Surprised by Truth 1, yeah. That's right. I read it straight through, and I just started pacing the floor. <laughs> I said, I know they're right, and I probably have always known they're right, and I can't afford for them to be right. Mm. So I sat back down and wrote to Pat again and said, I just really can't afford for you to be right. I know you're right, but this is going to be way too costly. Um, I have already left the Catholic Church twice, and all my friends and all my relatives, um, I have stated my case. I have tried to convert them to Calvinism. I have <laughs> um, hurt them on my journey as I left. I've, you know said goodbye to friends on this side and that side, and I just really need to stay put now and, and not mess with anybody's lives. <laughs> my kids, my husband, um, my own, you know, I was happy. And I didn't need this boat to be rocked right then, but I, as soon as I said that I couldn't afford it, it yourself, I knew that I was going to go through with it eventually. But... I was really still a Calvinist in all my thinking. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how will I ever unravel this? I, I really believe in it. I mm -hmm. really had studied my way into it, and I didn't know mm -hmm. how I could change my mind just overnight to Catholic thinking. Mm -hmm. So I, I gave myself time, all right. and I took a year. And um, 
Pat suggested that I contact Chris Franklin at the Coming mm -hmm. Home Network. And Chris started corresponding with me. And then she pulled in uh, Kenneth Howell. And yeah. we had a three-way email correspondence for a long time. <laughs> uh, for such a long time <laughs> that yeah. Chris got impatient and said, what are you waiting for? I and I said, I am waiting until I know I can be sure I'm not going to change my mind back. Because yeah. I want to be very sure. Yeah. And um, so during that year and all that correspondence, I was studying um, Council of Trent in response to the Reformation. Mm. And um, books about Catholic doctrine like the Eucharist, the, the Hidden Manna. A wonderful book, yes, um, Hidden Manna. The Shepherd and the Rock. Mm. Uh, is that what it's called? Uh, by Michael Miller? Yeah, I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure. It's about the papacy. It's really good. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah. The um, point was that you, was, you you were not just slouching through this. You were reading deep stuff. Because you had read very intellectually stimulating theological books when you became, Catholic, right. became Calvinist. And now right. you're doing it from the other side to examine the Catholic position on right. these things. Right. Right. Well, how long did that take? And uh, where was your family in this? <laughs> my husband was very nervous. <laughs> he did not want me to even investigate this. But this time I said to myself, instead of um, keeping quiet about it, not mentioning it, I'm going to keep it all in the open. I'm going to talk about it a lot. I made an appointment with my Presbyterian pastor to meet with him often to, you know, because I had promised to be accountable and I wanted to keep that going. Hmm. And... Um, as I was thinking things through, I would write out some things for my husband to read and what, and what they meant to me. It was too hard to discuss it, though, because we were just getting <laughs> arguments. We really yeah. Yeah. had to... It was much easier on paper. <laughs> so, um, that's about... Okay. I know you had many things in there that were helping you examine the Catholic faith, and you finally came in. When you finally came in, I don't want to keep bringing this back to... Again, the family struggles on that, but oh, yeah. we, we were fears realized. <laughs> My husband, um, when I got closer and closer, he got more and more adamant, saying, you can't do this to us again. You, you really um, are wrong. It can't be right. He'd bring up all kinds of scriptures against it. Um, he would also say, I am the head of the household here, and you have mm -hmm. to submit to me, and I don't want you to do that. Mm. And I would say, <laughs> I know, but first, I can't submit to you unless I submit to Christ. And if Christ is calling me to the Catholic Church, that's where I have to go. Mm. And that will make me a better wife. Mm. My guess is that there are some out there that would look at your journey back and forth askance. And, mm -hmm. and, and wonder, as you even some said some in your life. Talk to us a bit about making sense out of that from your perspective. As you look back and see that back and forth, mm -hmm. Catholic to the charismatic, to Catholic, to the Presbyterian, Presbyterian Calvinist, to the Catholic. Talk about okay. how you see that journey. Okay. Um, my first leaving of the Catholic Church was at that age when... Uh, it's time to look around and, and make yourself firm in where, what you believe. And, and also, I was newly married and um, trying to sort out um, the tension, you know, yeah. of two churches. And, and um, I looked at my church and thought it was not very enthusiastic and it was not very um, communal. And it was kind of lonely to go there by myself. Mm -hmm. And it would really be um, more comfortable and a lot less lonely if I just joined his mm -hmm. church. And I did that that time. Then going back to the Catholic Church, that tug of truth, that tug of the real presence and um, the sacraments and everything I knew about the fullness that, mm -hmm. that just wasn't there in the little independent charismatic church. I mean, no... Yeah. Um, you even told me that there was a time there when even you and your husband were both recognizing that that little independent church was going off the, the deep end on a lot of issues of theology. Yes, that was later. It, it was veering off. Because as there was no authority there. They could go, really go where the 
majority led in that church or were the charismatic leader led right. that there was no moorings for them. That's right. 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 And so um, the second, um, so then I stayed Catholic for a long time, but it, it also got, you know, lonely and it had its challenges. Um, and there was the, still the tension of the going to two churches. And, mm. and I had never met the intellectual mm. challenge before either. And so giving in again to that, um, mm. well, maybe there's really something else over there. Maybe Luther and Calvin were right. And, and the Protestant church is so friendly and they're so busy. And, and, uh, mm. and they're so uh, based on scripture and and there's so much to learn. I'll just, you know, go that way. Huh. And still, when it was time to come back the third time to the Catholic Church, the last time I'm here to stay, <laughs> um, I knew that nothing out there was going to satisfy except the Catholic yeah. Church. It, it, your two diversions from the Catholic faith, in a way, represent heart and head. Yeah. I mean, that's what they do. And mm -hmm. those are the the tensions that the voices out there will try and pull us off center from what is true, sometimes through our heart, mm -hmm. through our intellect. Right. And our Catholic faith calls us to recognize that both are important, but they need to be interpreted and guided by this, the church that the Spirit leads. Right. And you know that we saw that in both that group, that little, that, that, that small, and it is a small Presbyterian Calvinist group of churches, Mm -hmm. is one very small sliver of Protestant understanding when compared to all of Protestantism. Mm -hmm. But it's a very narrow perspective. Often those within don't see how narrow they are, mm -hmm. but it is very narrow. Again, sometimes when you're drawn to the intellectual side, you're, they can draw you to one small sliver of truth or emotion is kind of like whatever comes, whatever right. happens. Right. So your, own, your journey represents both of those. Mm -hmm. which are the temptations that all of us experience. What, what drew you to this wonderful book, which just came out, When Only One Converts, which I think there'll be a bookmark on this program sometime in the future, so you'll hear more about this book. But talk about your, how God led you to work with this book. I mean, part of it's your own experience, but what else did you discover when you came into the church? Well, when I came into the church, um, I was very grateful to the Coming Home Network, and I volunteered to answer and correspond uh, by email with other members and um, many of them had gone through the same struggles with a spouse or with family um, that they had disappointed and um, struggled uh, with the issues of unity and, and um, biblical submission and many many issues come up in this conversion when one of you is willing and the other is not. Yeah. So the more people I met and the more people I corresponded with, I felt the need for them to know that they aren't alone and also a need to put all the heads together and all the hearts mm -hmm. together and, and put it all in one place so that people would have a resource. They wouldn't just have to stumble across mm -hmm. um, yeah. a website. They could really put it all in one place. Because it is a difficult issue. Uh, I know that in our shared work in the Coming Home Network, I, I'm guessing that 80% of the people that come to us who say that they're interested in considering the Catholic Church, 80% of the time their spouse is at a different place in the journey than they are. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm guessing. But well, it's hard to be in the same place yeah. all the time, even for two Catholics. Right, exactly. So, I mean, sometimes they're, they're at different stages, and, but uh, amicably, right. but sometimes not. And the tension can then affect the journey. Mm -hmm. And so on the one hand, we have the statement by Christ in Luke chapter 14, where he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Those are strong. That's a strong statement. That's very strong. <laughs> and how do you apply it? And uh, my guess is uh, that in your working with this, you realize that we're not called to stand in judgment of one another, but beside one another. That's right. Yeah. 
which is, in my sense, what this book is all about. Right. Yeah, one of the first things I re wanted to tell people is that they aren't the only ones going through this. And since they aren't the only ones, um, there's at least emotional support, but there is also a lot of um, advice, scriptural mm -hmm. advice, um, pastoral advice, um, and just uh, healing for relationships by being in contact with other relationships. You know, your, your journey also is another model of me of something, and that is sometimes I'll, I'll get a comment that say, well, you know, you're talking about conversion to the Catholic Church. Well, there are conversions in other directions. And almost as if that they all wipe each other out. Yeah. That it's kind of indifferentism. It's just, Jesus is all that's important. doesn't matter what church you belong to. Well, in hearing the details of your story, and again, they're in Surprised by Truth too. it reminds me that you're one of those that kind of examine the different ways mm -hmm. at different stages in your life, both drawn by the emotions of it, the, the heart, the relationships, the other, other time the intellectualism of it, and recognize it through that. Now, this journey to the Catholic faith has a mandate to it that's given right. to us by Christ. That's right. And so it draws us to these difficult questions where sometimes we have to recognize that this is a decision that must be made, even if it causes great suffering. Yes, so we do it's, it in charity. It's worth it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the, yeah. obeying Christ is the bottom line, and if you can't obey Christ, then you know you might as well not even be in church. All the other <laughs> compromises can't stack up to being obedient. Being obedient and heeding His call to come to His church. Mm -hmm. He founded one church and promised the Holy Spirit to guide that one church, and yeah. Yeah. hasn't. Gone away. And when looks in history and looks at all the schisms that have happened, they're almost always an over balance of heart or head. Yes. I mean, that's what, it's a, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And we emphasize have, one truth in, to the exclusion of everything that's right. else. Or, that's right. And especially putting ourselves up as the sole diviner of what is true. I will decide what, no. And then we're called to be humble in that right. issue. Well, let's stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment with your questions for Lynn Nordhagen, especially on this issue of loneliness on the journey home. Welcome back. My guest this evening is Lynn Nordhagen. We've been talking a little bit about her book, When Only One Converts. We've been focusing on the fact that sometimes the journey of following Christ involves suffering. He promised it would. If we're going to imitate him, of course it would. And we recognize that sometimes the reason people leave is because they're not sure how to handle the suffering of loneliness. So looking for a way of filling that. And sometimes it isn't another church. Mm -hmm. Right? In our day and age, there's all kinds of things that people grab hold of to try and handle that, uh, that loneliness within. But we have some emails and some phone calls ready to ask you some questions. You ready? Mm -hmm. All right, let's take our first email. This is from Mark. Hello, Marcus and Lynn. My question is, how can you enliven the Catholic faith in a family? My wife is not religious, but I am. I'm unable to express my faith like hanging holy pictures and praying the family rosary, etc. My wife just doesn't want to do anything religious and thinks I go too far when I try to express my faith. What advice do you have? Um, my husband doesn't want religious pictures in our house either, especially anything specifically Catholic. Um, and at one time I was, as you heard earlier, even forbidden to say I was a Catholic. But um, as I just expressed who I am as a Catholic and just was honest with my own um, perception of the truth and, and my own um, grasp of Catholic teaching and, and would say, 
this is what I believe as a Catholic, and, and or just say something like, I went to Mass today and I am so happy that, I would, that in receiving Jesus I can share him better with you. Mm-hmm. Or anything that expresses my faith uh, right through my actions and my words, not through anything external. Mm-hmm. Although I long for yeah. saying a rosary or having a mm-hmm. crucifix on the wall too. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't agree more. We, we have to begin with communication. Mm-hmm. And that isn't always easy. Uh, husband and wife need to work at communicating better. Especially in these areas where they differ in religion, it needs to be communicated not when the kids are present. Yeah, you have to have your differing conversations in private. Yeah, you've got to work that through so that you put up a, a you know, a, a common front in front of the children. It's important. So that the face is expressed purely. So they need to, they, the children need to know that you both love Jesus. And yes. that Jesus isn't just something you fight about. Right, exactly right. right. But I thought another thing with that to add in that is um, that we live at a time that in which the church has been, suffered because of schisms. Those who have broken away and now, well, they estimate over 20,000 denominations around the world. And so th- there's a sense in which the suffering that we experience in a divided family and not being able to express our faith fully is part of the suffering mm-hmm. that we offer up for the healing of the church. And we recognize not only within a family, but how all around the world there are people who have to hide their Catholic faith even to live. Mm-hmm. So an encouragement would be you know, it, it doesn't always help to push these things on a family who doesn't understand the meaning of statues and rosaries and infants of Prague. And if they don't understand it and they're pushed on them, I mean, that's a negative. So it might mean not doing it and offering it up mm-hmm. and asking that the Lord would open hearts in time. Right, and letting your own joy shine in your own life. Exactly, exactly, exactly right. You be the image. Right rather than having the images. We be the image. All right, let's take our first caller. This is Mike from Ohio. Hello, Mike, what's your question? Well, first of all, I'd like to say to Lynn that I really think her story is inspirational and it really shows the grace of God working in our lives. But my question is for Lynn, uh, was there a special ceremony or what exactly did you have to go through um, having formally left the Catholic Church to formally come back into the Catholic Church. I know that you can only be baptized once, but was there a ceremony or a reconciliation, or what was it that you had to do um, ritually, I guess, to come back? Mike, thank you for your kind words, and uh, actually I'm glad you asked that question because my guess is that there are many Catholics, ex-Catholics, who might be listening and not sure what to do. Right. How to make that journey back. Right. For most ex-Catholics, if you haven't made a profession of faith in another church, all you need to do is go to the priest, go to confession, and you're back. Um, my pastor asked if I had made a profession of faith in another church, and I had made a profession of faith in the Presbyterian church. And so um, I made a renewed profession of faith in everything the Catholic Church teaches. And I chose for that the uh, profession of faith from the Council of Trent because it specifically addressed the issues I was wrestling with Mm. up to that time. Mm. So I made the profession of faith and then received um, the sacraments of confession and Holy Eucharist. All right. Great. Thank you. Let's take our next email from Billy in Florida. Dear Lynn, I am a member of the Charismatic Fellowship. What exactly would cause you to leave this group which is so supportive? You would agree it's very supportive. Very supportive, yes. If you need your house painted, 20 people show up. If you want to move, 40 <laughs> people show up. If you uh, have a baby, everybody brings dinner. Depends on how, mu- depends on how much they want dinner. you to move. You know, that, that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, there's nothing more supportive than a charismatic group, right. I agree. Right. Um, and that was wonderful. And, uh, Which makes it hard. It was very so hard. Yes. Well, what would make you... But want? the only thing worth leaving any of these um, is to obey Jesus, to to follow him, 
And uh, in this mm. case, he has told us that he has protected his church through all time mm. for us to um, be mm. called all into this one church. Mm. So that He promised to lead the church into all truth. Remain with the church. And he forever. calls all people to be in that church. That's right. That's right. Let's take our next email. This is it says your little brother in Christ, Marion in Kansas. Mm -hmm. Dear Marcus and Lynn, what part did authority in the church play in your return to the faith? Thank you both for your faithful faithful witness. Authority. You authority. just touched a little bit on that, but talk mm -hmm. more about the place of authority in your journey. Um I guess probably the main uh, impact of Surprised by Truth 1, when I read it, was to show that there really is one church, and Christ gave that one church the authority. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. any other authority is derived. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a really mm -hmm. good book on authority by Mark Shea, By What Authority yes. an Evangelical excellent Discovers book. Catholic Tradition. And that is an excellent, excellent summary of um, what authority really means. You know, that, it is funny that in the sense that <clears throat> whenever we tell our stories, we can't tell our stories coming to church without mentioning a bunch of books. <laughs> That's true. I mean, if we list all <laughs> the books that we had read along the journey, it, it would be dozens and dozens and dozens because they helped us see an important point, like Mark Shea's book on this issue of authority. But I also found it interesting that if you go back to your journey, especially when you left the Catholic Church the first time to go into the charismatic renewal, I remember you talking about what was common amongst many of those folk was that where was the authority mm -hmm. on determining what was true, and it was within themselves. Yes. The individual person, in fact, they might even say, well, I don't agree with everything that little our little church does, but but I, but it's a good church, and they have right. good donuts or whatever. But the, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm being facetious. But really, it's a good fellowship, or it's a good Sunday school, and I agree with everything they teach. As if it's just me mm -hmm. that is the authority. Right. Right. And that was prominent in the charismatic church. In the uh, Presbyterian church, they say the authority is in the Scripture, but then they have so many interpretations contradicting that. Well, again, that you know, one sliver. Of Presbyterianism mm -hmm. uh, was d divided from the other groups of Presbyterianism because it felt that it was the true interpreter of Scripture versus right. the other eight Presbyterian denominations. I think there's at least eight, maybe there's more in the United States, which is then different than Lutheranism and its interpretation of Scripture and Methodism, Episcopalianism. So again, where's the authority? Right. So again, drawing us back to and the authority of the church. And Christ said all authority had been given to him, and he gave it to his apostles. apostles and said he'd be with him forever. Mm -hmm. Let's take our first, our next caller, Elizabeth from Minnesota. Hello, Elizabeth. What's your question for us? Uh, hello there. Um, my name is Elizabeth, and I was um, um, just going to, I was just going to ask, I was wondering um, what the, um, what the um, charismatic church that uh, she was attending was, um, saying about um, the doctrines that were off the deep end, <laughs> Thank you very much. It was an independent charismatic church, so it was not associated with any denomination. Is that does that answer your question? I think she. Or did you need to know the doctrine? I think she was wondering about the specific doctrine. For example, what kinds of doctrines do these charismatic groups go off the deep end on? I mean, well, we're not, in fact, we don't mean to be narrowing the charismatic groups, yeah, but independent this, churches. Well, this particular one um, didn't believe in hell at all. Believed uh, there would be no physical second coming had uh, no baptism, no Eucharist, no sacraments of any kind, um, mm. things like that. Did they even believe in ordination at all? Um, well, they needed to have ordination to be practicing in the state, so... Yeah, so often ordination is a, a, a self-imposed tax issue in, in a way, but within mm -hmm. the church, often it, the emphasis is on the, the priesthood of all believers. There was a lot of emphasis over on Over against that. any particular called mm -hmm. office. Right, there was that. Uh, philosophy, but still they they ordained. They're, um, I guess what they w in general did was spiritualize everything mm. to the nth degree. Tell. Did they believe in individual like prophets on any given gathering, or you know, they have the, the inspiration of indiv individuals 
uh, in public revelation. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, if you if you allow for public revelation on any given Sunday, yeah. who's going to be standing in the position of declaring whether that's true or not, or whether it has to be obeyed, or to discern whether it's true? And, and that often that's the problem in independent groups that they're not answerable to anyone, mm -hmm. and, and there they are. Uh, let's take our next email. This is. Uh, it says, Peace in Christ from Anne. Good evening, Marcus and Lynn. Tonight's show hits home with me. Just having been separated from my husband who would not accept the church, I am a revert for the last two years. Yes, it is a lonely road, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. Can you recommend one of your favorite saints for strength in leaving, quote, the world behind for a deeper prayer life? St. Francis de Sales. <laughs> yes, um, I was received back into the church on the feast day of St. Francis de Sales, January 24th, 97. Uh, what was Francis, it about St. Francis oh, de Sales that you liked? He is, a, he is a great teacher and a very mm. gentle teacher. Yeah. I just Well, for one thing, his wonderful book on introduction to the spiritual life. On, introduction to, to the devout, devout life. life was written mm. for laity. Yes as a wonderful book, recommend it to all to read. But on top of that, he was sent by his bishop. Oh, yes. He was sent by his bishop into the um, Calvinistic provinces uh, around Geneva. and uh, Really, just after Calvin died. Um, Not long after that, the yes, end of the 16th right. and century. And he, he preached in that uh, province and converted many, many ex-Catholics back. Back. Yeah. So his journey of helping Calvinists come back yes. was modeling your um, own. Yes. Okay. I took him as my patron for, right, for I felt like he reached down to one more little Calvinist. <laughs> and there are a number of many saints of the church that you could recognize in this journey. One that I particularly like is St. Edmund Campion, who was a, a, an Anglican who left the Anglican church during the reign of Elizabeth, went to the continent, became a Jesuit priest, and had a cushy position, could have stayed, but didn't want to remain. Went back to England to help the Catholics in hiding and was eventually arrested and uh, martyred mm -hmm. in London. So he's a wonderful saint also. Uh, important question I always ask as we close. How has becoming a Catholic, all your journey, how has becoming a Catholic drawn you closer to that Jesus you met back in first grade? Hmm. Um, well, the Eucharist is really the center of the church and the center of the Mass. Um, it's, uh, the Mass is heaven on earth, really, mm. like in Scott Hahn's book, The Lamb's Supper. That's right. um, I love going to Mass, and I love being able to receive communion, the real body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus right mm. within me. Mm. That's, you can't get much closer than that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's been very good for my prayer life. Uh -huh. And uh, I think I just have a, a sense of, finality and peace, and, and this is home, and I am home to stay. Okay. Well, we thank you for your witness, Lynn, especially for the book, which you've put a lot of work in over the last couple of years, and I know that because mm -hmm. I've been following it. And all the witnesses of those in the book are there to help others discover the, the beauty of this church, with this, which, is worth, which is worth the sacrifices that are necessary. Jesus said they would be there, right? Thank you, Lynn, for joining us on the journey home. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment for some closing words for the journey home. Lynn has been sharing with us both the joys and the struggles of the journey of following Jesus Christ. He promised us that if we sought to follow him, it would involve the carrying of a cross. And in fact, he is, first of all, our model of that. I, during this time of Lent, as I was thinking about this theme of loneliness, I remembered the great spiritual, uh, that lonesome valley 
He had to walk that lonesome valley. He had to walk it by himself. Nobody else could walk it for him. He had to walk it by himself. The issue of loneliness. In the life of Christ, every time he made a choice along his journey, others would turn from him until at the end, he was alone on the cross. In fact, only two who loved him were there, his mother and John. And in the midst of that, he cries out, Father, why, have thou, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, quoting the Psalms, and sees only his mother and his disciple. He gives them one to another. And there we have the church. Mary given to the church, the church given its mother. But he also tells us that as we seek to follow him, that loneliness is a part of our own lives if we seek to follow him faithfully. I'm reminded of Paul's last, probably his last letter to Timothy. Let me read a little bit from it. He says, first of all, do not be afraid, he's writing this to Timothy, do, do not be ashamed then of testifying to our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel in the power of God. Paul recognizes as a prisoner, alone, suffering because of his love for Christ, that he is isolated from others who love Christ. And he desires, he says at the end of the letter, that they be reunited. Listen to this. Listen to this expression of loneliness. Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful in serving me. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all, the parchments. Alexander the coopersmith did me great harm. The Lord will quite him for his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. And he goes on, and, and the issue is that the following of Christ very often means carrying the cross of loneliness. It brings with it separation. And so we must be careful on the one hand of the temptation to go where our feelings draw us. If we're lonely, we go to the place where that loneliness is fed. It may not be the best place for us in many ways. But there's another side that this calling to follow Christ is not a me and Jesus alone. That's a modern heresy. Because when we follow Christ, Scripture tells us we become children of God, which means we're a part of the family, the church. And so even when we feel alone, like Paul, we are never alone. We're always with Christ, and we're always united, brothers and sisters, in the family of God. Let's never forget that as we walk together on the journey home.